All right. Let me just sort out a couple things here and we'll get started. There we go, got a little bit more light. So hopefully you guys can see me a little bit better. How is everybody doing tonight? Welcome to the stream. Uh, tonight is gonna be a little bit different than uh, most nights in the sense that uh, basically we're going to review some work that I was kind of doing off camera. Um, and I just kind of got it uh, in my head that I, I really wanted to uh, get some stuff done, but I didn't really have the time to uh, stream it and do it live. So I kind of started working on some of this stuff off camera. Um, and most of the stuff I was working on wasn't very interesting um, in terms of, you know, we need to do it live. And so um, we'll kind of go over some of that stuff. And then, um, you know, we'll kind of continue from there. So where we left off on the last video uh, was we were sort of redoing how our material system worked uh, in the sense that we're reworking the way that texture maps are uh, defined and used and we're removing some of the rigidity from those texture maps. Um, so before our material system was sort of hard-coded to say, well, we have uh, three texture maps that we use and they're always going to be in... Uh, specific order and those are the only three that we can use and obviously that's not going to work for our terrain which is sort of the reason that we're doing this um, this redux if you will and so um, there was kind of a lot of uh, non-interesting work that I kind of wanted to knock out uh, off camera and so I figure um, I'll quickly go over that now and then we'll kind of pick up uh, where that left off and I think going forward I may wind up doing that a little bit more because one thing that I'm noticing is, you know, it is taking quite a while to um, move forward on this, where I can only do it uh, on live streams. It's actually making it kind of hard to progress at a decent rate. So I think uh, I am going to start picking up and doing some things off camera, but we will make sure to uh, review those things on camera whenever I happen to do that so that nothing gets missed. Okay, um, with that said, Let's go ahead and start having a look at that. So I'm actually gonna take this terminal for a minute and get this out of here. Um, because uh, VS Code actually has a pretty decent diff viewing system. So I'm gonna use that because uh, it's a little bit easier to visualize this here than it is in Vim. So um, one of the first things that we did was, um, oh, for some reason, I've managed to delete a line here that I didn't mean to delete. So that already is not correct, right? So that one actually shouldn't have any full changes whatsoever. So uh, where we left off before basically was we were trying to read in this material file. And we'd gotten up to the point where uh, we could read these sort of globals. Uh, we got our versioning incremented um, or implemented rather. And we sort of had left off on doing uh, the parsing of these map sections and these property sections. And so I've gone ahead and done a lot of that off camera. Uh, some of the requirements for that though um, were as follows. So we did have a to do uh, for K strings where um, we needed a K string um, or a string to mat four function so that we could actually read uh, a mat four if we actually had one in a material. I don't think we ever would, but you never know, right? Some of some crazy material may actually wind up having it. So um, we had string to, you know, vector four and all the other types, uh, we were just missing one uh, to map four. So we've gone ahead and implemented that. And here is the implementation of this. Um, this right here is just that my auto formatter sort of um, uh, reordering um, the includes here. And then uh, down here is where we actually have the implementation of this function. So all this just does is a scanf uh, for 16 floats uh, space delimited. And it just reads them in right here, right? Nothing fancy. Um, obviously we make sure that uh, we didn't run into any sort of end of file, uh, meaning that it wasn't able to extract what it needed to. So um, we've gone ahead and uh, and done that as well. So uh, this is it. That's pretty pretty straightforward stuff, I think. 
the next thing is um, we have made uh, a couple of small changes to um, the resource types. Uh, so uh, one thing that I noticed was in the material map structure that I'd set up, I actually had misspelled uh, this. So I had filter max here, and this should be for mag for magnification. So uh, minimize magnification, right? Um, and then I just put some notes here that these are D-arrays, so the properties and maps. Um, since this is just a configuration object, it's fine to use a D-array. We can undo that um, when we destroy that. So I took out the property count and the map count because they are redundant um, due to the fact that these are D-arrays. Uh, and I think, yeah, we had, um, this is just a formatting change. So that's it for that. Um, I guess the next thing is, uh, before we jump into our material loader, uh, we did actually have, there was one more change that I'm thinking of, and now I'm trying to remember where I made it. Uh, it's probably going to wind up being on material system, I think. Um, so uh, we've changed the interface for our material system. Um, our material system acquire from config. We now take a pointer to that config instead of a copy of it, right? Because it's kind of ridiculous to, um, to be copying all that data. So we've changed that. Um, we've made a bunch of changes here to our material system. Uh, most of this is just reordering of the includes uh, done by the auto formatter. Uh, we've gone ahead and changed all of the sort of private methods to static. Uh, I guess this file is one of them that I missed uh, when I was doing that, so I've gone ahead and done that. Um, this change here is basically uh, we got rid of the dereference here because we are no longer taking a copy of this data we are taking a pointer and this is already a pointer. So most of the changes actually in here um, kind of reflect that. So uh, here again, um, we have this material system acquired from config. Uh, this is now taking a pointer to that. Um, and then of course we had to update the syntax all over the place uh, for that. So that's those updates. Um, we went ahead and also, oh, that's just another syntax update. Okay, so a little bit further down. We have um, a couple of new things. So, um, in fact, I may not actually show the diff on this section because that might actually make it harder to visualize. So I may actually just pull up the actual file. Um, in fact, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So uh, that's around line 435. So material system. Round line 435. Okay, so we have some new uh, static functions. We have this uh, assign map function, which takes a pointer to a texture map, a pointer to material map, uh, the name of the material we're currently working with, and what the default texture is should we fail to look up or acquire the texture um, that is defined in the config. And what this function does is basically eliminates a lot of code rep repetition that we had uh, previously. So basically we were doing essentially a copy of this code for the diffuse map, the specular map, and the uh, normal map. So now all three of those things are all texture maps really. As we're loading them in here, we'll all point to this function. And then this basically, it's the same logic as before. It's just, um, it, it deals with a pointer to a map instead. And so um, that actually allows us to cut down um, on the amount of code that we have. Uh, this load material um, has gotten some updates as well. So it also takes a pointer to um, material config. And then um, what we have here is we loop through um, the various properties. So um, in this case, we're looking at the Fong style of material. And we know what, what properties we need to extract from the config for that. So um, we go ahead and get a count of the properties. Um, and then we go ahead and define some defaults for uh, the material. And then we go ahead and we loop through all of our properties. And we say uh, the one that is called diffuse color, if it exists, 
we go ahead and define that. And then uh, the shininess, if it exists, we go ahead and override that, okay? So that is the properties of, um, of that. And then the maps themselves, again, Fong does expect uh, diffuse, specular, and normal. So now it actually looks these things up by name. So um, we no longer have this sort of rigid structure. Um, we can sort of you know, look these things up by name. And it's okay that we've hard-coded these here because um, once again, you know, we know that this is a Fong material um, and that we have uh, specific requirements for that. So here is where we are doing the assign map, right? So we just do that here and it's basically three lines of code uh, for each one of these instead of, you know, 15 or 20. All right. Um, unexpected maps are ignored. So I, I tried to be as explanatory, self-explanatory as possible in the way that I set this up, right? Um, in terms of uh, how this works in, in getting the shader, um, so if we have a material type of thong, uh, we first check to see if the config had a shader name defined uh, because that sort of treats it like an override. So it says if there was one defined, we go ahead and use it and we get that material. Otherwise, we just fall back to our default, which is the shader built-in material, right? So that's for our Fong. Uh, if we have a uh, material type of PBR, right now we're going to get a fatal error that that's not supported. Uh, we are going to be adding that, but uh, obviously we don't have that set up yet. Uh, and then if we have a material type of custom, then a shader name is required in that case. Um, and if we do not have one, we bleat about it and return false. Um, if we do have one, then we go ahead and get the shader. We also do some sanity checking just to make sure that um, the shader was able to be obtained. Um, and then here is where we gather a list of pointers to texture maps. So if you recall before, uh, this was a list of three texture maps where we uh, sort of manually put that in here. And now we are going to do this uh, a little bit differently. So we have this map count here. So we basically allocate an array. Um, and then we have um, the material type here. So Fong, we know what types of maps we have. And here is our three, right? Uh, for PBR, we'll have a different size and set of maps. And of course, for custom, uh, we will have a custom one as well. Uh, so we'll probably loop through some custom map range like this, right? And so I haven't implemented that yet, but we are going to have to do that for our custom materials, right? I want to get this up and running for our Fong materials first. Um, and then once we get to that point, um, we will go ahead and, uh, and start working on our custom shaders, okay? Uh, and then I believe most everything else in here is the same as before, except... Um, of course, we have the static added here um, and static added here, right? So everything else in here is pretty much the same, but this is where a bulk of the work was done. Uh, so material system, uh, the changes here are minor, right? It's really just this guy, right, in the header. Uh, we're adding a, um, a pointer to that, right? Okay, um, so... Uh, the next thing is the shader system, which actually does not have a whole heck of a lot of changes at all. Um, in fact, I think all I really, really did was remove code, right? So our texture maps no longer have a use, so I had to uh, remove that code from there, right? And when I did that, that triggered the auto formatting to do this stuff. So that's the shader system. You'll see that we also modified the font system. Uh, I had to modify this because I was getting a similar error. So down here, um, we had a, uh, a font atlas use, uh, which is texture map diffuse. Uh, we no longer have that, so that was removed. And the material loader is the last and probably largest piece of, all, piece of all of this, okay? So we're gonna kind of quickly step through this, but I think you guys have seen enough of the parsing logic that you'll probably understand how this works uh, at this point. So um, basically uh, we have a, a couple of uh, um, utility methods here. So first off we have this pound defined macro um, where we check the uh, actual mode against the expected mode. So we just make sure that we're in um, the appropriate parse mode, which is defined here. So uh, our materials right now have three modes, uh, which is the global mode, which is where you're sort of uh, parsing those global variables uh, at the very top of the file. And then uh, we have a map 
parse mode and a property parse mode, right? And so this is just to make sure that we are in the proper mode uh, that we should be for the given variable that we're actually parsing at the given time, okay? And then um, we have here our uh, material parse filter. And so uh, what this basically does is first it verifies the mode, right? And then it takes the trimmed value of the current um, string and grabs the uh, variable name as well as the parse mode and the texture filter. And this is basically it writes out to this, right? So what we do here is we say, well, uh, if the trim value is linear, then we set um, the filter to linear. If it's nearest, we set it to nearest. If it's anything else for some reason, um, then we bleat about it, but instead of crashing the whole thing, we just fall back to linear, right? So we write it out to the console, but we don't make that actually crash the engine. Parse repeat works basically the same way for repeat modes. So we have uh, repeat for texture, repeat, repeat, um, clamp to edge, clamp to border, mirrored repeat, right? Um, it falls back to repeat if it doesn't recognize uh, what is passed there. Um, okay, so um, we also have this, uh, this material prop um, assign value. So we, it used to be called material prop create. Uh, we, we actually still do have that, but it works a little bit different now. Um, so basically what this does is it takes in a pointer to a property and then the value. And it says, okay, well for that property, what's the type, which we would have already parsed. And then um, based on that, it knows how to go ahead and um, parse the value and assign it to the correct uh, field in the property, right? So that's what that does. Um, here is the uh, property create. So we take a name, uniform type, and a value, and we just create a property, uh, duplicate uh, the string for the name, and then we assign uh, the value that is passed in, and we return the property. Um, here is where we parse the property type, right? So um, when we supply the type, this is how we know what type that is, right? So it just looks at that and um, obtains the correct shader uniform type, right? Pretty standard stuff. Um, some of this, I think, is auto formatting getting us. So I'm actually going to change that, get rid of that change. Um, once again, auto formatter. Sometimes it does stuff I don't quite like, right? Uh, so uh, here is where we added uh, the stuff to basically uh, begin in our global parse mode, right? As we're uh, parsing the material file. Uh, we also have a current map and a current property that we maintain, right? And basically, whenever we come up to a map, we populate this guy. Whenever we come up to a property, we populate this guy. And then whenever we have the closing tag uh, that is present in the file, then we go ahead and take whatever is in this, push it to the appropriate DRA, um, and then wipe this out uh, for the next one. So um, this right here is basically the section tag parsing, right? So we basically say if the first character is an open bracket, uh, then we check the second one to see if it is a slash to determine if it's an open or close, right? If it's closing tag, we do some uh, state checking here to make sure that we're in the right mode, um, going from one mode to the next. Um, and uh, so if, uh, if we're in global, um, then we say, uh, Hey, you know, if we're uh, if we are closing a tag in global mode, that's weird, right? That should not be happening. So we bleat about that. If we're currently in uh, map mode, then we know that we're we're closing a map. So we say DRA push current map, right? Same for property. If we're in property mode, then we DRA push the current property. Um, Otherwise, we're dealing with an opening tag. Um, so in this case, uh, if we are in parse mode global, then we go ahead and do a check on the string to say, hey, is it a map? If so, our parse mode's map. Otherwise, if it's property, our parse mode's property. All right. Um, in either case, we go ahead and continue. So we flip up to the next line. Um, I think this is more formatting stuff. Um, I'm not quite sure why it added quite so many of these, right? I'll try and sort of delete those as I go. All right. Um, 
So next, uh, as we're processing variables, we want to sort of be smart about uh, some of the, the variables that we parse, right? So um, each one of these modes actually has a name in it. So we need to determine, okay, if we're in global, then we're setting the resource data name to the trimmed value. If we're in map mode, then we need to duplicate the string to current map name. Otherwise, uh, we do the same thing for property if we're in property mode. Um, here's another one. All right, um, and another one, and another one. My formatting the other night was uh, was sort of bugging out, if you recall that. So uh, that's probably where a lot of this came from. Okay. Otherwise, we have all of our new properties here, right? So um, in this case, we go ahead and we um, parse the filter for min and mag. Uh, we parse the repeat for u, v, and w. Um, and then we parse um, the string for texture name uh, if we're in map mode, obviously, right? So all of these do sanity checks. Um, if we're in property mode, we do have a type, right? So we, that's where we get the type. Um, and this is where we get the value, right? So that is uh, most of what we have there. And I think that leads us to being caught up. Um, I think that's all of the changes that exist. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put VS Code away and switch back to our handy dandy terminal. And you can see here, I've just been kind of working through, um, you know, resolving errors as, as we go. So um, I'm going to go ahead and build real quick. And it looks like our uh, texture use cube map is, uh, is in use. So we need to go to skybox C. So skybox C, And we see right here that we have um, cube map. So we don't need that anymore. Um, I think that was the only the only error in that file. Uh, all right, so our mesh loader, our mesh loader has a whole crap ton. So um, it's actually doing all kinds of things. And that is because, if you recall, our mesh loader um, for our loading of uh, OBJ files also loads the OBJ uh, material format and that's going to have all kinds of things that are you know making assumptions about the way that this stuff is handled so um, we're actually going to have to handle that so um, this is in mesh loader mesh loader and we're basically going to um, proceed through all of the errors until we finally meet a, um, a completion, right? So, yeah, this is in the parsing of the OBJ material. So we have, no, oh, my kitty sneezing. I think her allergies are getting to her today. That's unfortunate. All right. Um, Okay, so this is going to current config diffuse color R, G, and B. And it looks like, so T, T gets ignored. And yeah, and then we have R, G, B. So um, we're actually gonna have to add a new property to this and parse this to that instead. So um, we'll say material um, config prop and we'll say prop. Um, and we're just gonna default everything here to zero. And um, we'll go ahead and say uh, prop um, name is equal to, um, let's see, do we want to hard code this? Yeah, we'll go ahead and say, um, 
diffuse color, right? Um, and then prop type uh, is going to be, I believe, I believe that was a vector four. Um, so this is going to be type vec, uh, what was it? Float 32, four. Right, and then um, this instead of current config um, diffuse color. This is going to wind up being prop dot value v four uh, dot r, and. Prop dot value v4 prop dot value v4 okay um, and then we're also going to set uh, looks like we're defaulting the we are defaulting the alpha to 1.0 so prop value v4 dot alpha is set to that. So that should fix that. Um, I have a feeling I'm gonna get some formatting changes here. Yep, that's what I thought. Um, okay, so let's go to the next error, which is down here. Um, so we don't have shininess, right? Oh, you know what? Uh, <laughs> I created the property, but I didn't actually push it, right? So uh, this should be current config dot properties, right? And we want to do a uh, d array push. So we want it to properties, and then we want a prop, right? Um, and actually. I'm going to copy this, come down here to shininess, paste that there, and then also grab this, All right? Um, and this is going to be just a float 32. Right, and that's going to be uh, shininess. So we want uh, uh, prop dot value um, f thirty two. Okay, uh, and then we go ahead and we push that into the array. So that's going to fix that one. Uh, let's see. So diffuse map name. Uh, in material config. So I guess what we're going to have to do here is just create a um, a new map for each one of these things um, with default repeat and default filtering. I think is the way we're going to have to handle this. So I'm actually going to come up here and uh, material config prop prop um, zero that out and then um, oops we don't want that actually we want map sorry we want a map not a property uh, okay, so we now need to say um, map.name will be handled there. We can set our defaults up here. So map dot uh, filter min equals map dot filter mag equals filter mode linear. Right, we're just going to make that assumption um, right here. Um, I don't know if we actually have a way in OBJ material files to, def to define any different. So um, let's put a note here. 
making some assumptions about filtering and repeat modes, right? Uh, so now we need to say map dot uh, repeat u equals map dot repeat v equals map repeat w equals texture repeat repeat. Um, and that takes care of all of that. So the only thing we should have to handle now is the texture name itself. Um, which is interesting because we have oh right uh, name versus texture name so there's actually we need to switch this up a little bit so what, what we're doing right now um, here is we're actually taking in the file name which needs to go to the texture name but we can actually do that up here because it doesn't matter which one of these maps we have um, or any map, right? It's going to be the same, the same deal. Um, right. It should be the same format as the find up here. So um, I'm going to go here and move this guy up. And uh, we're going to say map dot texture name. Um, I forget, does this actually, this is a destination. From a full p file path. I think we should be good to do that. Mm. No, because that's not going to exist. So we should probably do... We should put this into a temporary buffer first. So we'll say uh, buff... Actually, I don't want to know if I want to say buff. I might be using that above. Um, text name buff. And we're going to set that to set it to 512 characters. Right. Um, and then we can actually do text name buff. So we'll do it to that and then we will do a string duplicate. Uh, so we'll say um, map dot texture name equals string duplicate text name buff. Right. Um, that way we have a buffer to sort of do all of our string formatting into and then once that's all sorted out we can copy it here. Um, Okay, so that is going to take care of the texture name. Texture name, right? Um, this is going to wind up being the map name slash type is what we're going to call that. Uh, so we'll say map dot name. In this case is a diffuse, so we'll say diffuse. If I can spell it right. And I'm actually just going to do that. Um, get rid of these guys. Get rid of that. And then this is going to be, I think we went with the full word specular. And then this is going to be normal. 
All right. Okay, so that should sort out our mapping. Next. Normal map name. Do we already... Why do we have... Oh, I think this is the weird thing in... In MTL files. Where the normal map can actually be specified as bump too. And we wanted to support that. Even though bump maps are different from normal maps, we want to treat them as as normal maps. So I wish I could just reuse this, but I guess I'm not going to be able to. Nope. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think though, I think I should be safe to go ahead and copy it though. Uh, oh, there's actually one bit here I forgot to do. D-ray push. Um, current config dot maps uh, and map. So we need that to make sure it gets added. Um, and then right here, uh, before we actually, I guess we could do this after we do the scanf, right? So right here, we'll paste in that. And then we should be able to basically do the same thing. Um, I already have that. Uh, actually, all I need to do is set the map.name. So map.name equals normal. Okay. Uh, I think that covers that. Uh, we do need to do this. So... Go ahead and write that change. Coconut, hello, welcome. How are you doing tonight? Hopefully well. Uh, let's see. So the next one is shininess once again. Okay. So in this case, we just need to create a shininess property and push it to the current config. Uh, so that is going to be... Why are we checking this? So... So here we're switching to a new material. Current config shader name, shader built-in material. Current config. Trying to remember exactly what I was doing here. It's been a while since I've looked at this code. Hi, how many years of C development do you have? Um, I switched to C full-time about mm, three or four years ago, but before that I used what I call C++ Lite, um, which was C like C++, um, and I used that for probably another 10 years on top of that. So quite a bit. Um, but yeah, like I said, I made this. I made the jump to C um, a few years ago. Never looked back either. Uh, all right. So this should probably be done when we actually. 
when we actually process the shininess. Which didn't we have? We do have it. Wait. Is that another instance of that? Down here. So we're doing the sanity checking here. This is where we're writing out, so I don't need that one. Where are we actually reading in shininess? Were we not doing that? That's very bizarre. Tamman, hello. How are you? Welcome. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome. A bit late, but you came in? Eh, not too bad. I mean, well, okay, 45 minutes, but no worries. Um, so uh, I'm just making changes to the material system now uh, to support a dynamic, um, a dynamic number of maps. And of course that's caused some problems in some other parts of the, the code base that I'm working through now. So like our mesh loader, when we load in the OBJ uh, mesh materials, uh, we basically need to convert that to use um, our dynamic material definitions, if you will. Um, I could have sworn, yeah, specular exponent. There it is right there. Wait, is my, oh, my color's wrong. Is it? Diffuse color. Wait a minute. Oh, what a dingus. Okay, that would have been a bug. This should be no wonder. Okay, so all of that sanity checking that we were doing before, um, we really can just do here, right? Because that's a property. So once we parse this, we should say um, if prop value f32 equals zero, then prop value f32 equals 8.0f. Um, and need to make sure this is non-zero as this will cause artifacts in the uh, shader. Um, in the rendering of objects. Okay, so that means uh, these other errors here, this error checking that we're doing, um, we can actually get away from. All right, so we can get rid of that one. And we can get rid of that. Uh, did I get rid of the comment that was up here? Yeah. Okay, so we don't need that. And I think that does it for the reading of that. So now we should have it parsed out of the OBJ material format correctly, I think. Uh, so now we need to handle the reverse of that, which is writing the KMT file, which we were writing to sort of version one, which was, um, which was, um, looked kind of like this, right? So this is version one uh, versus version two format here, right? So get rid of this. So uh, we want to write version two now. We don't want to write version one anymore. Uh, okay. Let me just catch up on chat here. So cool. Been working on the editor for my engine. 
and having some fun with WPF. Yeah, WPF is kind of cool for for making editor stuff. I've made editors with that before. Um, it can be super powerful. There are things that get really annoying when you have to make custom controls with it. But yeah, it's kind of a neat system. It sucks that it only works on Windows. Um, I kind of like the, you know, using markup to define your UI is kind of cool. Um, it's like HTML, but not kind of. It's kind of cool. Uh, let's see. Confused Chameleon. I am a Python developer in the field of artificial intelligence. Would you say that learning the basics of C to write speed critical code is worth it? I know C is uber super fast compared to Python, but is the effort worth it? I would say yes, the effort is worth it. Um, because Python is great for prototyping things, but if you're already asking about you know, speed and performance and stuff like that, you're never going to get that out of a language like Python, right? Um, and C really forces you to understand the underlying tech and how this stuff all runs um, in such a way where, yes, you can shoot yourself in the foot, but it's also a super valuable learning experience and how to optimize your code for that, right? So um, I would say it's worth it. Yes. Um, I think you can use WPF with Linux. Really? Using .NET Core? I don't know. I haven't looked at that stuff in so long. I think the last time I looked at WPF was... I think .NET Core wasn't even a thing. <laughs> like it was before they did, did all that stuff was the last time I looked at, at WPF. Most Python libraries are written in C, C++. Yep, um, that is true. But uh, yeah, .NET Framework is Windows only. Yep. Yeah, not a huge fan of it because of that. .NET Core is cross-platform. See, like what I don't get is why they didn't do it that way to begin with. But, you know, now they have two .NETs, I suppose. <laughs> because Microsoft. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, so, looking at this, uh, thankfully, what's here is not very complicated. But what we're going to replace it with is going to be a little bit more dense anyway. So... We have a material config here, so we can iterate on that and basically extract all the information that we need. Um, they deprecated .NET Framework. Holy crap, really? That's interesting. I didn't think that day would ever come. .NET Core is only called .NET now. Wow, okay. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm way behind on that stuff. I haven't touched it in years. I think it's... It's probably been better part of a decade since I've really touched that stuff hardcore. Um, the place I worked at a couple of years ago did some of it, but I didn't really touch it all that much. I mostly did front end stuff there. So yeah, I didn't realize they completely deprecated .NET framework. That's actually kind of funny. But yes, that's very because Microsoft, for sure. Um... All right, so we're still going to write to the same place. Uh, this is just getting that, writing that. Material file version uh, one. Okay, so I'm going to uh, replace that with a two. Um, should we write out our comments like what we have here? Maybe we should. Just... Just in case, right? Um, do we not actually? Yeah, okay, we do have shader name here. Okay. Um, so actually, line buffer. So we need to grab these two. 
and put them, see we have material file version two, and then name after that. So we're gonna put the shader stuff probably here after this guy. Right, um, and then I suppose we can go ahead and just, you know, write a comment uh, here, just for you know ease of use for anybody that act actually happens to uh, read it. So um, we'll say if custom shader is required. Okay. Um, so we have name here. So before hard coded version, it is hard coded. Do we, are we ever going to want to change that though? I don't, I don't think so. Like if we do have to change, you know what? I'm going to get rid of that to do. I don't think that really matters. Okay. So type. Oh, you know what? We have custom here. This should be, this should be Fong because we don't have custom implemented yet. Um, okay. So why are you, what are you doing Vim? Let me move my water bottle out of the way. The file has changed since reading it. How and why? Oh, I see. Uh, let's see. Let's reread the file. Right, because of that uh, that change I made over in VS Code. Okay. So. Um, Now we should be able to write it. Oh, wait a minute. What did it? Oh, did it really read the whole file in again? I think it did. All right, whatever. Uh, I'll just fix it manually. Uh, not that one. I think that's all it was missing. So UVW, UVW, UVW. I think that's, I think that's right now. Okay. Anyway, um, so the next thing we need to add is this type, um, which is going to be hard coded. Uh, but we want that comment above it as well. So um, I'm going to copy this guy and put him twice. Right, and. We are going to say here, uh, types can be fong PBR custom, okay? Uh, and this one is going to be type equals fong. And I'm gonna add a to-do here other material types because I believe I believe that the OBJ material type also supports PBR so we probably want to support that at some point um, okay so looks like there's some chat I need to catch up on here so thanks to learning C will not only enable development in C but also enable me to write better Python code because you have a deeper understanding of how the code works under the hood Young developer, three years, so looking for the best way to further my skills as a developer. To improve your skills as a, as a programmer, code bad things is greater than learn why they are bad, is greater than code less bad things. <laughs> oh, those are arrows, okay. Code bad things, then learn why they are bad. Code bad things, repeat. Yes, the single best thing that you can do to get better at programming is to program a lot. 
a lot, a lot, a lot. Like it's, it's really the only way to ever get better at it. Right. You can read as much theory as you want. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, you have to apply that somehow, right? Like the understanding the theory is, is, is needed and required, but you have to, you have to apply it. You have to do it um, many, many times. So repetition is key. Python is re really useful for tooling. That's true. So yeah, put yourself in a recursive loop. Exactly. Yep. A recursive loop of getting better at programming by programming. Yeah, very much so. Uh, okay, so I think we're pretty much sticking to our same format here. So that's the header of the file. And then uh, all this crap here is basically what we're going to replace. So um, let's go ahead and file header, right? Let's just let's comment this a little bit. Uh, and then we'll say... Um, We'll write the maps first. Okay. Uh, so, whoops. So here, um, we'll do a U32 map count equals D array uh, length. And we'll have, um, was it M? Nope, config. Uh, config maps and then you know for u32 i equals zero i is less than map oops map count ah map count see and you could be like me who's been programming for most of my life and i still can't type for crap right I mean, I can, but I just have butterfinger bars for fingers. So there's always downsides to everything. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, for each map, uh, we are going to need to write the name and texture name. And then all of these filter and repeats are going to be well, we would, have, we would have defaulted them when we were reading them in. So uh, we actually just need to write them out as they are. So um, I guess we'll do, hmm, how do I want to do this? So we'll say string format and um, we're gonna write this to line buffer. Uh, we will do a, Let's do name first, right? So we'll say name equals uh, percent %s. And then um, that percent %s will be uh, config maps sub i. Um, name. Do I not have uh, fat fingered the type? I was like, why is this not working? There we go. Okay. So we'll write the name, um, which obviously means that we need uh, this. All right. Um, So actually, we're just going to be following this pattern, come to think of it. Mm, actually, maybe not. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Let's say... We'll do another one. Another couple, I guess. Um, so we need the filters, and then we need the repeats, and then we need one more for texture name, which I'm eh, no, I'll do it down here. Keep it, keep it consistent. All right. 
So, in this case, we will change this to filter min. And how do I want to do this? There's only two here, so I think I'm just going to use a ternary. Uh, so we'll say uh, config maps sub i dot um, filter min. And we'll say if that's equal to texture filter linear, then we'll write linear. Otherwise, we will write um, nearest. Okay. Um, and actually, we can actually grab this line and paste it here. Delete this one. Because the only difference is that. And here. Right. So that's the filters. Um, and then these are going to be uh, what? Our repeat. Repeat. So we'll start with U. And this one is not quite going to be that simple because uh, there's a couple modes here. So let's actually write a uh, a quick little function to get uh, that value for us. So we'll say static because we only want it to be in this um, compilation unit. Uh, this is going to be constant character array uh, and we'll say string from uh, repeat and we'll say repeat text to repeat rather, repeat. All right, and we'll do a switch on repeat. And then case, uh, in this case we'll say text repeat, repeat, return, repeat, case text repeat, Clamp to edge, return, clamp to edge, case, text, repeat, clamp to border, return, clamp to border, case, text, repeat, uh, mirrored repeat. Let's just go ahead and say mirrored, right? Um, and then we're also going to make our default case, whoops, if I can spell, we're going to make our default case uh, repeat, okay? This just keeps me from having to do all this in line. Uh, so now we can come down here and here we can say um, string from repeat and we'll say config maps sub i dot repeat u right and that'll just give us the string and jam it into that format as we need it um, so we can go ahead and just put these in here delete that one delete that one this is going to be v w V, W, all right? So there's our repeats. And then this one is just going to be texture name. Instead of name, we're gonna do texture name, right? Uh, so we'll do that for each one of the maps. Uh, we got an extra line up here. And then we'll basically do the same thing for uh, the properties. So we'll say u32 prop count equals the array length config, whoops, 
config uh, properties for u32 i equals zero i is less than prop count plus plus i boy I am fat fingering the keys like crazy tonight all right um, so for our properties our properties are much simpler thankfully uh, so we do have a name so I'm actually going to yoink this and plop that right in there and just change this to properties sub i right so that's nice and simple uh, so the type we're gonna have to basically do the opposite of what we did before where we're gonna go from the actual known type to a string um, this is reality at TV you can write great engines you also can't type <laughs> yeah no kidding I mean like I have proper typing form and all that, but like for some reason, I'm just constantly hitting the wrong keys. I don't know what my issue is. Uh, does ternary differ in any way from if blocks to the compiler? Is there a performance difference? Um, that depends on the compiler. Um, as far as I know, it's it's literally just a a jump when it gets compiled down to uh to assembly. So I think it's, I think it's, I think it literally comes out to be the same thing. I could be wrong about that though. I'd have to, um, I'd have to run that through, uh, what's that site? Maker, thank you so much for the follow. Uh, I think this is the one. Let me just make sure that I have. So let's investigate that theory. Uh, let me actually pull this. Pull a floating window down here for a second. Um, so... Let's see, I guess, um, I guess let's say int val equals two, right? Or something like that. Uh, and then we'll say uh, return val equals two. Uh, we'll return, let's do something besides an int. Um, Let's do, I don't know, let's do a string, right? Fine, whatever, const. Because that's kind of the example we were working with. So uh, two, and then we will otherwise say not two. Yeah, so it's a jump of not equal in this case. So we can take that and I guess let me, I wonder if it's going to let me do this. Uh, EX1, EX, EX2. All right. Um, and now we'll say, um, well, I guess I can't do it in line like that though. So if I were to convert this to an if, um, I'd have to set some sort of value, right? So I'd have to set, um, I don't know, ret, right? And then say if val equals two, ret equals two, else ret equals not two, right? And then here we would just return ret. 
right? So I literally think uh, it winds up being Uh, let me change this actually so that it's kind of the same logic. So we'll say character ret, um, and then we'll say equals, and we'll wrap this, right? And then we'll return ret. Uh, let's see. Can I not? Oh, because this one's const. Right, because I'm doing it in line. Um, so it looks like jump if not equal or jump. Jump if not equal or jump. So yeah, it looks like it's the same thing. So yeah, it literally becomes the same thing. This is, of course, GCC. So if I were to change this to, um, I don't know, some newer version of Clang, I think we're going to find it's going to be the same thing. Uh, not quite, actually. So like I said, it, it heavily depends on the compiler. What I can tell you, though, is unless you're doing this in an extremely tight loop, it doesn't freaking matter. <laughs> um, more, more than likely, if you, if you have some sort of performance issue, like that is not going to be your issue. You know what I mean? So, yeah, depends on the compiler. Oh, I should have checked Visual Studio, too, to see what it did. Okay. So... Who Zabi? Who I think I pronounced that right. Who Who Yazabi? I'm not sure, but thank you for the follow. Hope I didn't butcher that too bad. Tired Beaver, thank you for the follow. Appreciate it. Okay, so um, we're going through our properties. Uh, so that's the name, uh, the type. We're basically going to have to do. Uh, you know what? Didn't I have? Let me make some notes down here because I need to switch away for a second. So we need type and we need value. All right. Um, so when we were loading the material, I thought I had something in here that actually did this. This is the opposite, I think. I may wind up using the, moving these to like a, a utility class somewhere because I could see needing these, but I basically need the opposite of this. Ugh. Okay. All right. So I'm basically going to switch that. And I'm, instead of returning a shader uniform type, I'm going to return a constant character array. Uh, we're going to change this to string from type, I guess. And then we will say shader uniform type type. Your bio says VS Code, but you're using NeoVim. Yes, I switched to NeoVim um, a month or two ago, I think. Something like that. Uh, I should probably update my bio, though. Yes. But um, this project does uh, actually work with VS Code, so I'm maintaining that compatibility. That compatibility. Um, so anybody that wants to use that can use that. 
Um, I'm not going to, you know, enforce that anybody uses NeoVim, right? Um, I'm not including my configuration, although my configuration is available on my website if you want it. Um, but uh, I just kind of, I like coding in NeoVim better. Um, I just find it a lot quicker and easier to navigate in a lot of things. There are still some things that I use VS Code for, like its diff viewer can't really be beat. Um, its refactor is a little bit better than the one I have available in Vim too. Um, and I haven't really fully worked that out. Like there's a couple things that every once in a while I have to open up VS Code for, but as an editor, I think this is way superior. That of course is my opinion. So you're by no means required to use it, but uh, you know, that's, that's where I'm coming from. Okay, so we can use the handy dandy switch on this. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna switch on type and I'm going to move these up here. these guys should probably handle these ones as well uh, okay and that's the end of my switch okay so uh, instead of return uh, I'm gonna change word to uh, case And then um, I'm just going to replace these with semicolons or colons. I forget. I always mix those two up. All right. And then uh, in this case, we're going to return uh, F32. This is going to be return VEC2. Uh, this is going to return VAC3. Return VAC4. Return, ah. Return, uh, let's see, did I go I8 on this? I think I did. I think that's how I did it. Return I16. I think I did it that way to maintain consistency. Return I32. Return uh, U8. Return U16. Return U32 and return map 4 and should I have some sort of default here I think I'm going to I'm going to say default uh, return I'm going to default to I32 because that's kind of what C defaults to whenever it can't determine something. But I am going to say uh, K error um, unrecognized uh, uniform type treat it as a number defaulting to I32, right? So at least we get something out of it. Um, and then we'll put type here, right? So that is that, uh, string from type. We just need that from here. So uh, let's see, 
we probably are going to want to do a string format. Uh, so we are going to want uh, these two things. All right. Uh, this is going to be um, type equals and then string from type config properties sub i type okay so that'll just jam that in there and then the last thing is the value there is no clean way to do that unfortunately um because we don't know without examining the type what field to pull that value from. So, unfortunately, we're all gonna have to do another switch here. Um, on config properties sub i type Uh, I can't think of a cleaner way to do it. Let me go to, let me go to material loader again, uh, because this guy, does this have Zero proper sign value. I mean, this kind of gives me what I need. These are all the cases I need. So let's copy this. And then uh, instead of string to F32, um, this will just tell us what property to extract from. So I guess we'll just do a string format on each one of these. So string format um, we are going to change this to line buffer and then value equals and in this case uh, it's a float yeah And we want the value F32. And then we'll go ahead and write it at the bottom. So we're basically going to have to do, oh, this isn't, this prop doesn't exist. So this is going to be config properties sub i dot value 32. Right. Okay, so we're gonna have to do that one for each and then we should be in good shape. Uh, good night and good stream, too tired to, I'm too tired and I have to get up early tomorrow so no ferrets for me today. Oh, okay. Yeah, I probably am gonna switch over to ferrets tonight too. But yeah, I feel the tired thing for sure. I am as well. But we're making some good progress tonight. I don't know that we're going to get compiling tonight, but maybe we will. Sometimes it happens in the last like five minutes. Um, okay. So do we have, I don't remember, um, back to, I don't think we have like a two string string from No, we don't. We probably should though, for the vector types at least. I wasn't gonna implement that, but I think I probably should. Um, was that in K string? I think it was. So, 
we have all these string to functions, right? String to mat four, string to vec four, vec three, vec two, etc. Um, but I don't think we actually have the opposite for any of these things, which would be super convenient for this actually. I feel like that's something I'm going to implement off camera just because it's going to take just a long, just long enough to be annoying. So um, I guess I'll just go ahead and do this uh, string format for now. So um, in this case, we're going to have, uh, this is a vector two. So we're going to have two of these guys. Um, so v2 and we can get rid of that right. uh, we can get rid of this we'll add another float uh, change that to v3 Add another float here for the vector four. All right, uh, and now the integer types. The integer types. I technically could just treat them all as integers because I'm just writing them to a string. So I'm actually going to group these guys together, save myself a little time here. So that's int 16, int 32, and then u int 16 and u int 32. And then I can kill all that. Um, all right, and these two I don't worry about. Okay, so let's put this here. And uh, the value in this case is going to be D. And oh, shoot, I can't do it that way, can I? Because the value. Nope, they have to be split up. Dang it. Okay. That's what I get for trying to take a shortcut. At least it'll be quick though, because I literally can just do this and this and just change this at the end. Oh, I don't want six of those. Okay. And 32, right? Okay. So let's handle the, whoops, I need both of these lines actually. Okay, and once more here. All right, uh, in this case, it just needs to be unsigned, right? Unsigned, 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 16, uh, 32, all right? So there is that. Um, annoyingly, I'm going to have to do a version of this with 16 of these. Oh, 
which is really, really, really super annoying. Um, so actually, Okay, so that's 8, 12, 16. See, if I had a function to do this, I wouldn't have to do this in line. Um, this is going to have to be value map for. Right, and then I'm going to have to do Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. Uh, and then I should be able to do, uh, what was it? I'm trying to remember the, I think it was G control A. Nope, because <laughs> it's incrementing the, ugh, okay. There we go. Uh, actually, I don't think I want the first line though. I think it's G. don't have all the keyboard shortcuts memorized yet. So G, Control A. There we go. Oh, and I missed one. So I'll just change this one manually. All right. So. These all have to have data on them, don't they? This has to be... Wow, that did not work the way I wanted it to. Is this OpenGL? No, uh, this is um, Vulkan. The, uh, the render, rendering backend is Vulkan. Um, I'm thinking about supporting OpenGL at some point, but for right now, it's just Vulkan. Uh, let's see. So we'll say data, I think it is. Yeah. So... there really is no there's probably a much quicker way to do this but off the top of my head I don't know what it is and there's only 16 of them so might as well just do it okay I think that's right so um, get rid of that don't need that okay so we have the string formats uh, we just need a copy of this guy to write that. So right after our switch here, put that in to write that out. All right. Okay, so that's gonna be each property. So I should probably write properties. 
Okay. So that should be good. Uh, and then this is all the version one stuff, which now we can, I believe, remove. Okay. All of that. Let's try another build. Let's see where we get. So, okay, that's not too surprising. So there is some stuff in the Vulcan backend that we're going to have to change. Um, if I had to guess, this is probably going to wind up being how we determine what like the default map to use is. Which, come to think of it, I don't think the backend should actually be doing. Right, because we've removed this map use. Is Vulkan really that much more performant than OpenGL and DirectX? It depends on how you write it. So it has the capability of being. Um, most of the time, with what most people do with it, I would say probably not, unless you're super skilled at it, right? Um, you're probably not going to see that much of a difference performance-wise. Um, like I said, unless you really, really know what you're doing. Um, most of the places you're going to see performance differences are like in the commercial engines where they have massive teams of people working on this stuff, right? Uh, is it because you can make less draw calls with it? Yes. So that is definitely a thing. Um, you can make a lot less draw calls with it, um, than OpenGL, uh, DirectX, well, DirectX, it depends on what version of DirectX you're talking, right? Cause 11 and 12 are vastly different. So, um, 12 is pretty much. I would say Vulcan-like in a lot of ways. So I would say yes there, but um, for 11, not so much. But um, one of the big things is, is, of course, uh, with DirectX, you're bound to Windows, right? You can use Wine and stuff like that, but if you're targeting... Um, if you're tar targeting a platform, you don't want your end user to have to, to mess with that, right? Um, and the problem with OpenGL is it's deprecated, right? So um, there's not going to be any further development with that. Have I looked at WebGPU? Is it worth using over WebGL too? Uh, I have looked at it um, kind of a little bit at a time as it's been coming out. It's still like not widely supported at all. I think only one browser actually has support for it where you can actually render to it. Um, so right now I would say no, only because it's not widely adopted, but once it is, absolutely. Um, but for right now, like if you're doing stuff on the web, WebGL2 all the way, for sure. Uh, okay, so back end. In my testing, WebGL2 has around 400 FPS difference between OpenGL. Mm, what do you mean by that? So the thing about WebGL is it's also, its refresh rate is typically limited by the browser. Tons of draw calls, OpenGL beats, well, of course OpenGL is gonna beat it, right? Because WebGL has got an extra layer of abstraction to go through and it has to go through the JavaScript layer. So yeah, I mean, of course, native open jail is going to be to any day of the week for sure. But remember though, um, like I said, web jail too, um, in terms of FPS. Yeah. So that 120 Hertz that you're getting is a limitation imposed by the browser. The browser is never going to run at 500 frames per second. Right. Um, on a really intense scene. Yeah, so you're you're never going to see like the the browser limit literally limits how fast you can refresh it, right? It's that's a browser limitation. It's not a limitation of OpenGL. It's uh, it's supposed to run at 144 FPS. I don't think. Well, that depends on the if again if the browser you're using supports that. Oh, when pushing it, it dips to 120. Okay. 120 specifically, I was thinking that was 
probably the browser limiting it. But if it dips to that, then yeah. I mean, but again, interpreted versus where it dips to 500. Yeah, I mean, I can't say I'm surprised. I mean, you've got all the all those layers of abstraction and extra stuff on top of you know it running in a browser. The code is identical. Yeah, I bet it is. But it's a, it's only identical in what what you're able to actually write against it, right? Like the underlying browser's implementation of WebGL is not going to be identical. Okay. So, uh, this is exactly what I thought it was. Um, so, I'm trying to think what I should do here because maybe we should just get the default texture and be done with it and not try to do any of this, right? Because this is, this is heavily dependent also on a Fong pipeline. So I think, I think what I'm going to do is see this and then ax all this stuff, right? Uh, that is what makes the most sense to me. All right, so that should do there. Let's build. Okay, so theoretically, we should be able to run now. Do I think it's actually going to run out of the box? Nope. Totally think I've missed something, but we're going to try it anyway. So we'll launch the test bed. Okay. Uh, so it looks like we've definitely hit something. Uh, so, oh, a string copy. Oh, that's not terribly surprising then. So, resource data name. So let's see what our resource data. Oh, is it trying to it's trying to copy to resource data name, which doesn't actually exist. Because I don't think that's actually been... Yeah, it doesn't exist. That's why. Why is that happening now, though, I wonder? So, does name exist? Name does exist, test UI material. So instead of a string end copy, I should probably be doing a string duplicate there. So here, um, resource data name string duplicate name all right let's try that again okay that seems to have at least allowed us to launch so that's something uh, let's see Fong is still a thing. Yeah, so Fong is the very first lighting model that we've implemented on our engine. Um, just because that was sort of the simplest to start off with and explain in terms of how it works. And we are going to be moving to more advanced shading models for sure. Uh, but I wanted to start off supporting something simple so that we can kind of get all of our systems up and running without having to worry about, you know, some of those other complexities kind of getting in our way, right? And then once we have... Um, all of our systems up and running the way that we want them to and they're uh, configurable then yeah spheres too yep uh 
Manually rendering pixels, lines, yeah. Do you like the manualness of Vulcan? So, I will say that it's helped me to understand a lot of the concepts a lot better um, and how they work, at least under the hood, because OpenGL, you know, abstracts a lot of that stuff away from you. So, from that standpoint, I feel like I do have a little bit more control and I like that aspect of it, but the verbosity of it is super annoying. Um, and, I mean, true to... A lot of things that you do and see, it's very easy to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the API. I'll be completely honest. I think it's it's got a lot of issues. Um, what about using my own abstraction? So that's kind of what I'm doing um, because this engine is actually being built um, with it in mind that uh, eventually we're going to have multiple backends, right? So right now. Um, we only support Vulkan, right? But that Vulkan renderer is actually a plugin into our engine. So uh, eventually there is going to be a DirectX plugin and an OpenGL plugin. And so all of that stuff has to go through an abstraction to make all those things work correctly to the front end of the renderer, right? And the rest of the engine. So um, we are actually using an abstraction layer already. All right, uh, I'm going to hit the load key, and it's probably going to blow up horribly, but we'll see. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, this is just a skybox. <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a skybox is all it is. Um... I figure if the verbosity is redundant, you might as well go through that copy pasta logic. Yeah, and the problem with that is, is like, it a lot of it is copy pasta, except for like one or two characters sometimes. And that one or two characters selecting the wrong thing can really, really screw you up and take a long time to debugging to sort of figure it out. So you should make a Half-Life 2 Lost Coast-esque map. I mean... That might be fun, right? I, I have been thinking about making like a um, a classic type of game. Um, all right, so. Why is this? Let's see, what thread here are we? Should be the first one. What are we hung up on? There's no way. There's no way my mutex is messed up from this. It's not give me a seg fault or anything though. I am just going to terminate the session. Let me let me have a look at the the old console log here. Oh, here we go. All right, here we go. So it looks like our parser is foobar. So that's neat. Um, validation errors. What do we have going on here? Draw command indexed. Pipeline layout compatibility. That's not surprising, being that we're screwing with the material system. Uh, we're not pushing, setting push constants, okay. Mehdi, thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate it. Okay. I don't know why we're not 
pushing that yet, but I suspect it's probably related to what we're doing. Um, all right, so unexpected variable diffuse color should only exist for version one materials. Ignored. So I think, did we break our version one parsing? We might have done. So, section tags. So I'm wondering, we didn't get in any of this, so that should be correct. Lucas, thank you so much for the follow, appreciate it. So I guess we should probably see what this is actually getting though. So we'll set a breakpoint here. Let's go ahead and run. Uh, let's close this buffer. Um, okay, so the version is parsed as one. Okay. Um, So we clear the line buffer, go to the next line. Let's set some breakpoints on some of these ones that are bleating here. So um, I think it was probably one of these guys. It only exists for version one. Like, I don't remember exactly which ones it was, but I think it's. Uh, let's see. Let's continue. Right? Okay, so. Diffuse color. Our version is zero. Why is our version zero? Oh, what a dingus. I see what the issue is. It's a scoping problem. What a dingus. All right. Um, that was in here. So our version is here. And it's getting reset every time we parse a line. So that's awesome. Um, that's definitely not right. So let's bring that from here. We'll go up to here. Um, let's put it right there. All right, let's launch. And uh, I'm going to kill this breakpoint. Okay. So that looks like it's good. Uh, let's go ahead and hit load again. And it looks like we are having an issue getting something out of one of our D arrays, which tells me that the array itself is probably a null pointer. Yep, it is. So D array push 
FTR loader load. Okay, so we likely didn't create these DRAs, I think is what the issue is. Um, in fact, I'm quite positive of it. Uh, let's see. So we have current map, current property. Wait a minute. We did create that though. Resource data properties. DRA create. We're right there. What line was that again? Three twelve. I don't think I need any of these guys anymore. All right, so resource data, pro oh, properties, properties and map. I thought I did that though. Resource data properties. Yeah, it's right here. It's going to be something stupid I'm missing, I'm sure of it. So for some reason that was coming through. Oh, let me get rid of this. Resource data properties. Huh. Can't explain that one. And I think this is probably where I'm going to leave it for tonight, quite honestly. Uh, let me just ch catch up with chat real quick. If it's like one or two characters that could be fixed easily, but I'm guessing it varies in different places. Can your abstractions be run through a parser? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Can my abstractions be run through a parser? What parser? Uh, what do you think of overly descriptive functions if programmers named a SOFO? <laughs> they would call it a multi-user buttholder. Uh, <laughs> that's hilarious, by the way. Um, so I see that done a lot in corporate environments where they have like these huge long names for things. I find that frankly ridiculous. <laughs> um, but I mean, kind of like what you're talking about is like your multi-user buttholder kind of insinuates use of uh, object-oriented programming, which I'm also not a fan of. So, um, you know, I... I don't typically like doing those things to begin with. But yeah, the huge, long corporate names I'm not a fan of at all. But yeah, um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, and leave this here. Um, uh, on birdies for some reason. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and leave this here. Um, I am going to check in the code and push it up to the repo uh, to the Material Redux uh, branch so that you guys can uh, have access to that in the meantime. Um, and in fact, I'll go ahead and just do that now. So we'll get add, 
yeah, so that's all the changes that we've gone over. Uh, commits, work in progress, uh, material, um, texture, map changes. Right. And there we are. So that's pushed. Um, and you guys can now um, get access to that. Uh, kind of like a compiler, but a function writer. Are you talking metaprogramming? Would you say function writer? I have to assume so. But anyway. Um, so... I guess I'm not really sure what the end goal of that would be. Like when it comes to abstractions, like I'm not, I'm not sure what you're getting at to be completely honest. Adds time, indeed. All right, so um, with that, I think uh, this is where I'm going to end the stream for the night. Uh, I really want to thank you guys so much for following along um, and being here and interacting with uh, with chat and whatnot. Uh, we are going to raid, uh, let's see. We are going to raid ferret software because ferrets are cute and um, because the ad revenue from this channel goes directly towards uh, the ferrets that you see on screen as well as adopting uh, ferrets that were used for like lab testing and stuff like that. Um, the guy that uh, runs this channel um, uses all the funds from that to adopt and care for ferrets and give them uh, a better life and I think it's a great cause. So. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start the raid, and uh, I thank you guys so much for being here, and I appreciate you guys. Uh, if you haven't already, check out uh, my YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Travis Roman. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, all those things as well, um, and I post uh, updates there, uh, and as well as uh, my Discord server. Feel free to jump on there if you have any questions. Uh, all right, cool. Uh, so I will see you guys later. Peace.